Let's talk about our problems, not the bad kind, but the kind that let us ask questions of our learners and just generally wake them up a bit as they study. Here you can see I'm in the studio, and the first thing I'm going to do is hit the problem button to open our template menu for this component type. You can see we've got two tabs here, basic problems and advanced. Advanced has some pretty niche stuff in it, so I'm not going to cover that bit in this video, but you might want to go and poke around in there later when you're experimenting. For now, let's focus on this basic tab that you'll see when you first hit that button. This list looks long, but they're actually all just ways of inserting the same things, just with handy templates for you to follow. You can use these to speed up the process of inserting your problems, and you should, but I just want to show you how flexible problem components can be by starting from scratch. So to do that, I'll hit this blank common problem button. If you have access to Studio, such as a Taho trial account, you can follow along with me as I do this, or you can watch and give it a go later. Or both, both is good. In order to actually get started though, once we've inserted this problem component, we'll need to go into the edit button. So let's do that. This editor window is hiding a secret that I like to pop out whenever I'm working on a problem, just in case. On the right side of the window, under this question mark, is a cheat sheet for how to write your problems. It's super handy, so I'm just gonna pop that open and I'll refer to it as we work. First up, as you'd expect, let's get our question in here. Otherwise known as a question label for Reasons. So let's go with a simple true or false question and let's not overcomplicate it. We'll ask true or false. It'll do for now. You can come up with your own question later. So what's the markup for our label? Let's check our cheat sheet. We scroll down and we find it's two little chevron thingies on either side of the question. So let's pop those in. Great, we've got ourselves a question. How do we answer it though? Well, it only makes sense for this question to have a single correct answer in this case. So check box around the question. Therefore, when you have multiple answers that make up the answer. And it would be silly to have the learner type the word true or false, or even silly or a number, I'm not sure how that would work. So that leaves either multiple choice or a drop down. On the surface, these two options are pretty similar. They're both intended for you to pick a single answer from a list, but there's a simple rule of thumb to go with here. You want to use a multiple choice in almost every occasion, unless there are more than about five answers to choose between. The main reason for this is multiple choice rules just stretch out your page if you add more and more answers, and it'll look just pretty silly. So for this question, we only have two potential answers, true or false. So let's stick with multiple choice. If we check our cheat sheet, uh, you can see this is marked up by using parentheses with an X on the correct answer. We can type these for ourselves, sure, but there's an even quicker way. Um, we'll just hit this button over here. Boom, multiple choice. So I'll edit these so that the correct answer has the X next to it. And we have our correct answers. And the first bit of our question is done. As a reminder, all you need to do to add more options is add another line and another set of parentheses. I'll just do this just to show you how easy it is. There we go. You can even have multiple correct answers so that learner can get the question right just by answering with either response. So you've got a little bit more flexibility than you might expect, despite only expecting a single correct answer. Let's put one last touch on this question, because we're pretty much done at this point with the basics of the question. We're going to give it an explanation. This is displayed if the learner hits show answer or just after they've answered the question correctly. You can think of this as being a why this answer is correct. This is very useful for if a question's answer is a bit unclear or your learner might just be guessing because you haven't actually taught them what the answer is yet. To insert an explanation, our cheat sheet shows it's just from literally surrounding it with the word explanation in square brackets. But once again, let's be lazy, we've got a quick option for this. Boom, light bulb done. Let's just add our explanation itself. There we go, uh, because I say so. And our problem's done. Before we make our problem available to our learners though, despite being done with all the question -y, answer -y bits, we've got a few last settings to tweak and understand. Let's first hit settings and quickly scroll through them. First up, the display name. This one's really important because it displays to learners as a heading above our question. So we need to make it a good one. In my case, um, I want to number my questions, I think. You don't have to number your questions. You can call it whatever you really feel like. And if there's only one question in there, it probably doesn't make sense to give it a number, let's be honest. But in this case, I'm just going to put question one in there because this isn't a real question. Uh, obviously, you should put a bit more thought into this than I have. 
Scrolling down our options, we've got a lot of these to cover, so here's a quick version of the most important ones, and I won't mention the ones that you'll probably never use. Setting maximum attempt stops learners from just attempting questions endlessly until they get the correct answer. You don't want to set a maximum on this though, unless it's part of an assessment. You want to set a number lower than the number of options available, else nobody will ever get your question wrong if it is an assessment. Your problem weight is how many points the question is worth. If you don't enter anything, this defaults to one point per input. So if you include more than one question in your problem component, which by the way is something you can do if you really want to, and you have a multi-part question, you'll get one point per input. So you might want to do something like setting the entire problem component to be one worth one point, despite the fact there are multiple inputs within the question, else it's going to be worth one per input. The show answer setting does about what you'd expect. It defines when learners could basically just give up and be showing the correct answer. There's a lot of options here, so I'm not going to cover them all, um, and instead put them in a nice little table underneath this video for your reference. If you're watching this on YouTube rather than the AppSemble Academy, you're going to have to sign up to check it out, sorry. For now, I'm going to set this to my favourite setting, Attempted. This means learners have to at least give it a go before they get to view the answer. If you're doing an assessment, you may never want them to see the answer, and as you'd expect, you'd set that to never. The Show Reset button option lets learners reset their answer. It still keeps their previous attempts, it won't reset their number of attempts out of three or whatever you've set it to. So it's not a full reset, but this can be really handy for checkbox problems in particular, as that way they don't have to untick each of every one of the individual answers if they want to just start it over because they got it wrong. Lastly, time between attempts is a very niche one we're probably not used, so I probably shouldn't have covered it, but we're here. It can be helpful to just force learners to pause and reconsider their options before they try again. Um, I normally wouldn't recommend having this one here unless it's a very deep question, in which case probably not a multiple choice. Let's just consider that. Now that we're through all those, let's hit save, and we'll try our problem out in studio before we publish our page, just to make sure everything's working. Okay, looking lovely. And we can see our explanation. Great, because I said so. There are lots of other little additional features you can add to problems. This isn't as deep as they go. Uh, we've got hints, adaptive feedback, other interesting tools like that. But that's a bit beyond the scope of this course and this video. And honestly, we've already been here for too long already. I can sense you nodding off. We need to do something a bit more interesting. You'll need to check out a more advanced course on the AppSemble Academy, or read some of the other resources on our knowledge base if you want to play with those. Or I guess if you're an AppSemble customer, ask your customer success manager. Um, if you know all this, we can show you. So give it a go, experiment for yourself, try throwing some problems around in your content. Besides using problems for assessment, it's a really good idea to just wake your learners up from time to time by asking some formative questions, just to check they're paying attention, and to let them confirm for themselves that they've actually understood what you're telling them. Nobody likes just sitting reading and having no idea if they've got the right idea. Online learning can be isolating, and problems let you just inject your teacher voice to say, are you listening? Can you hear me? Thanks for watching. I'll let you get back to the course now if you're watching on the Academy. If you're not, you should go and check it out. That's academy.appsemble.com.